Hi friends, your read aloud today is Ida B. Wells' Let the Truth Be Told. Just a quick reminder that your exit ticket for this story is chronological order, so you're going to be listening while I'm reading for five events that happened in Ida B. Wells' life that you could put on a timeline. So anytime you hear a date, you may want to write that date down and just take a couple of notes of what happened. Here we go. Ida B. Wells was born on the 16th of July, 1862, in Hollow Springs, Mississippi. The first child of James Wells and his wife Elizabeth was beautiful, bright-eyed, and healthy. Still, there was much to worry about James Wells, although a skilled carpenter was legally a slave. And so was his wife. Three years later, the Constitution of the United States was changed. The 13th Amendment made slavery illegal. All the black people of Holly Springs were now free. Over the next few years, young Ida was joined by three brothers and three sisters. The Wells children were taught to be responsible for one another and the family home. Each child had chores to do around the house. When the Methodists started a spring or a school in Hollow Springs, James Well made sure that his children attended. Our job was to go to school and learn all we could, Ida would say later. My mother went along to school with us until she learned to read the Bible. After that, she visited the school regularly to see how we were getting along. Encouraged by both of her parents, Ida became a good student. She could handle schoolwork better even than some of the adults who were just learning to read after a lifetime of working in the cotton fields. But Ida saw that life was not good for all black people. There were places black people could not enter and jobs they could not get. If blacks were accused of crimes, they often would not get a trial. Some were even killed by angry white mobs. When a person was killed in this manner, it was called lynching. Ida saw the sadness and fear caused by the lynchings. In 1877, 16-year-old Ida was visiting her grandmother in another part of Mississippi when she learned that yellow fever had struck Holly Springs. Both of Ida's parents and her youngest brother died. Heartbroken, Ida returned home. She listened as the family's neighbors and friends talked about what they could do to help raise the Wells' children. That won't be necessary, Ida stood up as tall as her five feet allowed. I can take care of my family. It wouldn't be easy, Ida knew. They could live in the house that her parents had owned and would have small savings that James Weld had carefully put aside. Ida decided to take a test to become a teacher. She had no experience teaching, but she had helped her sisters and brother with their lessons. After passing the test, Ida taught in a small town six miles away from Holly Springs. A friend of the family agreed to keep the smaller children while Ida worked. Ida taught during the week and came home on weekends to do the washing and ironing for her brothers and sisters. Each Sunday night, Ida would ride back to the country school on an old mule. She worked in small schools around Holly Springs for two and a half years. Ida's Aunt Fanny lived in Memphis, Tennessee, 43 miles north of Holly Springs. There were more teaching opportunities there, and in 1881, now Ida was 19, moved to Memphis with two of her sisters. Teaching was just as hard there. Ida had to travel by train to get to her job. She often used the time on the train to read or write letters. She read newspapers and whatever books she could find. She also began to keep a diary. One day, Ida took a seat in the ladies' coach of the train. The conductor refused to take her ticket and told her to move to the smoking car. Ida knew that the conductor wanted her to move because she was black. She refused. The conductor tried to pull her out of the seat. Ida was small. She braced her feet against the seat in the front. When the conductor put his arm on her arm, she bit him. The conductor got two strong men, and together they dragged Ida from the car. Ida, very upset, left the train and went back to Memphis.
Ida decided to sue the railroad. She won her case in court and was awarded $500. The local newspaper, the Memphis Appeal Avalanche, ran the story. The headline read, Darky Damsel Gets Damages. Ida also wrote about the incident for her church paper, The Living Way. Judge Pierce, who was an ex-Union soldier from Minnesota, awarded me damages of $500. Later, the court's decision was reversed, and Ida did not receive the money she had won in court. But she did see how people reacted to the article she had written. Ida continued to write for her church paper, and soon black newspapers around the country began to carry her essays. She wrote under the name Lola and was called the Princess of the Press. T. Thomas Fortune, the noted New York publisher of the New York Age, wrote, she has become famous as one of the few of our women who handle a goose quill with diamond point as easily as any man in newspaper work. If Lola were a man, she would be a humming independent in politics. She has plenty of nerve and is as sharp as a steel trap. By 1889, Ida had stopped teaching and wrote full time. She even became part owner of a newspaper called Free Speech and Headlight. In August 1892, both her sharp pen and her nerve would be put to the test. The People's Grocery Store was owned by three of Ida's friends. A dispute occurred between the three and some white men who did not like the idea that black men owned the store. A fight ensued and shots were exchanged. The next morning, hundreds of black men were arrested, including Ida's friends. Several days later, the store owners were taken from the jail by a white mob and murdered. Ida was filled with grief and anger. She knew that the deaths of black men were often ignored. Longing for justice, Ida turned to the only weapon she had, her writing. In her articles for free speech and headlight, Ida urged the black people of Memphis to leave town or stop supporting white businesses or riding the white-owned steel car line. Ida Wells had organized one of the first economic boycotts. She was threatened, and her friends feared for her life. When Ida left town to visit New York, her office was invaded by hoodlums and destroyed. Ida was forced to leave Memphis, but she was determined not to be quiet or fearful. She began writing for the New York Age from her new home in Chicago. Her articles exposed the poor treatment of black people, especially black men. More than any other person in America, she spoke and wrote about the crime of lynching. She believed that all Americans, black and white, were entitled to equal justice. In 1893, she published a book on lynching titled The Red Record. Her good friend Frederick Douglass wrote an introduction to the book. Dear Miss Wells, Brave woman, you have done your people and mine a service which neither can be weighed nor measured. Ida was invited to speak in England and Scotland. She spoke with eloquence and passion about the unfair treatment of black men. In the past 10 years, over a thousand black men and women and children have met this violent death at the hands of a white mob, and the rest of America has remained silent. In June 1895, Ida B. Wells married Ferdinand Lee Barnett, an attorney and newspaper publisher. Susan B. Anthony, who fought so hard for women's rights, worried that Ida would give up her life as a crusader for justice. Ida replied, Miss Anthony, don't you believe in women getting married? She said, oh yes, but not women like you who had a special call for special work. I know of no one in this country better fitted to do the work you had in hand than yourself. Although she was raising her own family, Ida Wells did not abandon her role as a fighter. In 1900, the Chicago Tribune ran a series of articles recommending school segregation. Ida asked for help from another brave warrior in the fight for social equality, Jane Addams. Miss Adams brought together a group of influential white business people to hear Ida plead her case. Ida Wells convinced them to keep Chicago schools open for all children. On June 
Although a wife and a mother, Ida continued to write and organize. In 1909, she was one of the major speakers and organizers of the group that would eventually call itself the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Ida Wells understood that among African Americans there were important differences. Those who were powerful and doing well often weren't willing to make a commitment to help the poorest among them. They wanted to be respectable. Ida Wells also wanted to be respectable, but felt it was her duty to fight for justice. I'd rather go down in history as one of lone Negro who dared to tell the government that it has done a dastardly thing than to save my skin by taking back what I have said. Ida continued her fight for justice by taking up the cause of suffrage, her friend Susan B. Anthony lifelong mission. Susan B. Anthony's lifelong mission was suffrage. After talking to Anthony about voting rights, Ida was convinced that women's suffrage was critical to political change for black women. In 1913, Ida created the Alpha Suffrage Club. It was the first voting organization for black women in the state of Illinois. At Woodrow Wilson's presidential inauguration in 1913, Ida and 5,000 other women marched for the right to vote. When white suffragists asked Ida to march in the separate colored section, Ida sternly refused. It took several more years of hard work by Ida and many others, but women finally won the right to vote in 1920. Ida Wells spoke up for what she believed in. Her weapons were her keen mind and her pen. Leaders as different as W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey, the black nationalists, consulted her. In 1930, feeling that the candidates for state legislator in Illinois were not doing enough for the people, she ran for the state senate. She did not win the race, but again, her clear and passionate voice was heard. The following year, on the 25th of March, Ida B. Wells died. For more than a half century, this dynamic, intelligent woman used her writing skills to promote freedom, safety, and justice. She made America a better place. And in the back of this story, it has a nice timeline for you, which I will post pictures of on your exit ticket, so it will help you when you put these events in chronological order. Let me know if you have any questions. Bye, guys.